Bluetooth, FPGA, battery management and flash memory all on one small module. Hey, it's Raj here and today I want to tell you a bit about this little guy, the S1 module, including some of its features and how you can use it. Let's go. The module consists of these four main ICs. Everything needed to support them is already built in, so all you need to do is apply power. This could be 5 volt USB or a lithium cell and the device is up and running. Let's take a look at these four devices in a bit more detail. The Bluetooth IC is the Nordic NRF52811. This is a 64 MHz Cortex M4 device from Nordic. It's the smallest uh, IC from the NRF52 series and it's also the one with the best received sensitivity. It supports Bluetooth 5.2, Bluetooth direction finding as well as thread. It contains 192K of RAM and 24K of flash memory. Now that might not seem like a lot, but remember we've got this external flash chip and there's a few clever things we can do. We'll come back to that a little bit later on. The FPGA used is the Lattice ICE40 Ultra Plus. This device contains 5000 LUTs, includes 1 meg of single port RAM, it also has 120k of distributed RAM across the fabric. There's a built-in PLL, two I2C cores, two SPI cores. These are both hardware IP cores, so they don't take up any of your LUTs if you decide to use them. Uh, there's also two internal oscillators, a 10 kHz oscillator and a 48 MHz oscillator. And there's also eight built-in uh, hardware MAC blocks that you can use for DSP operations. FPGAs typically require quite a few power rails to get up and running. This is why we've included the Power Management IC, or the PMIC. As I mentioned earlier, there's built-in lithium charging. You can charge a single lithium battery from a 5 volt source, such as from USB. The PMIC also contains a number of voltage regulators, including a buck boost regulator. Three of these are broken out of the module, so you can use it in your external circuit. There's a buck boost output, an LDO, and a 1.8 volt rail that you can use. Finally, we have 32 megabits of flash memory. This is where the FPGA binary should be stored and can be downloaded via the NRF52. Once the FPGA comes at a reset, it will load the binary out of the flash memory. After this, the flash memory can be used as user storage and accessed from both the FPGA and NRF52. The majority of the IO go into the FPGA this is where you can do any signal processing or data acquisition before passing that data to the Bluetooth chip. There are, however, two I.O. that go directly into the NRF52 chip. These can be used for any of the NRF52 peripherals, such as ADC or waking the module up from deep sleep mode. And just a quick look on the back of the module. There's not much here except some passives and crystals. These are, this is the side where you would solder down to your carrier board, uh, your PCB or your FPC. And you will need a slot cutout to clear these passives, of course. The antenna for the module is just under this section here. The two pads, the two last pads, are the ground for the antenna. And these should connect to a ground port on your PCB. The ground port or any other traces shouldn't go directly underneath the antenna, but they can run along the edge of the antenna up to the board edge. The recommendation for this antenna is to place it center to the edge or six millimeters, at least six millimeters from a corner. Here's an example of how you can lay out the module on a carrier PCB. So you can see the module is centered to the board edge over here. And then if we flip it over, you can see the slot that is cut out for the passives. You don't need to go all the way to the board edge with the slot. It can just be to clear the passive, so it's only a mechanical thing. Um, but again, you don't want any ground pour under here, but you can have the ground pour go all the way to the board edge in this section here. That's completely fine. So that's a brief overview on the S1 module. Be sure to check out the full documentation at docs.siliconwitchery.com. Check out our GitHub page for software examples and tutorials, and keep an eye out for more YouTube videos we'll make on setting up the workflows, tool chains, and some other examples we'll be doing on the S1. There's also this board, which might come in really handy if you want to prototype. It breaks out all of the pins of the S1 module and includes a few handy connectors for you to get started with. Happy hacking, and we'll see you in the next one.